Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am O'Brien McMahon, and this is People Business. In this episode, I'm joined by Bonnie Lo Craman. For 25 years, Bonnie worked as the personal assistant to Oscar winner Olympia Dukakis. From there, she became a sought-after author and TEDx speaker on workplace issues. Her new book, Staff Matters, People-Focused Solutions for the Ultimate New Workplace, offers a thoughtful approach to bridging the gaps between all staff in the post-pandemic world. Through her writing, workshops, and speaking engagements in 13 countries, Bonnie strives to bring the voice of the staff to the forefront to build an ultimate new workplace for our children and grandchildren, the staff of the future. In this conversation, we go deep into everything executive assistant, and we talk about executive assistants, personal assistants, administrative assistants. We kind of lump it all together to talk about how professionals can partner with individuals to gain leverage in their day-to-day lives and work. And that's really what the conversation is about, is how do we create leverage through partnerships with somebody who can assist us in the work that we're doing? We go soup to nuts, beginning to end. How do you interview people? How do you onboard people? What does a good working relationship look like? How do you deliver feedback? How do you develop an assistant? All kinds of conversations that we really don't have very often. Maybe we work with somebody, maybe we don't, but we've thought about it. Maybe we think of the CEO who has an assistant out there. Maybe you are an assistant. Maybe you are a CEO who has somebody who's integral to your business. Wherever you are on that spectrum, this should be a really interesting conversation if you're curious about how you can leverage yourself or how you can help leverage somebody else. I had a ton of fun. I learned a lot, as you'll hear in this episode. I hope you do too. Here is Bonnie Lo Craman. Bonnie, welcome to the show. Very excited to have you on. I've done 130, 40 something episodes and we have not yet talked about this topic of assistants and administrative professionals, and they are just a huge part of what makes the world of work tick. And so I am thrilled to have you on and explore this today. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be the first. Delighted to be here and always fun to be the first one. So let's get to it. Sure. I got a lot of questions for you today. As we were talking about a little bit beforehand, I am somebody who has had a little bit of help from assistance over the years. And over the last probably 18 months, I have worked very closely with a great assistant and I have been trying to figure out the right ways to leverage myself. And I've probably been making a lot of mistakes. So I'm interested to get into this, but let's just start at the beginning and establish some terms. Are we talking about administrative professionals, executive assistants? Are there differences to some of these terms and what are they? Therein lies the confusion in the profession. There's a lot of conversation about the verbiage, the words that we're using to describe this role. The umbrella term is administrative professionals. And under that category is a whole roster of titles But when you're talking about support to CEOs and the C-suite, those are typically executive assistants and mid-level and lower level positions are administrative assistant, administrative business partner, lots of terms like that. Generally, most executive assistants who are supporting high-level leaders also work in the personal realm. So some of them are even called EAPAs, executive assistant slash personal assistant. And that's what I did for 25 years with Olympia Dukakis. And it's very common, unless a company has protocol or mandates against assistants doing personal work, most assistants do it. Meaning we only get 24 hours in a day. So in 2023, a great assistant can help you leverage your 24 hours in a day. And sometimes that means planning a dinner party or going out and getting, picking up a gift or just some personal tasks, which is totally All right. Cool. Where you just, you walk me right up to the precipice. And before I jump over, want to just sort of set the table a little bit more for the conversation. So how has this type of work evolved over time? What have you seen and where are we today? Yeah. The work, especially since the pandemic, but it had begun far long before that. Here's the thing. 
you know, my own mother was a legal secretary back in the day in the 70s and the 80s. And the world of work has become more complicated. We have the proliferation of a lot more technology. So the workplace itself has gotten more complicated and therefore the assistance to leaders have had to up-level their skills. So it's gone from being a, a transactional role to something more strategic. And the idea that there are more pressures on leaders to get it all done in a day and therefore assistants are now taking their seats at the table, at leadership team tables. In fact, some assistants are viewed as part of the leadership team. They have access to their leaders' inboxes, email inboxes. Their opinions are sought after and they are key members of a team. And that has not always been the case. But that's where we're headed, mainly in order for leaders to fully leverage their time. These assistants are functioning at a very high level. Yeah, that was one of the stories that stood out in your book, Staff Matters, was the assistant who became the interim CEO, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. A hundred percent true story where it was a construction company. So the CEO absolutely had a robust leadership team. And when he had an emergency medical situation that he needed to handle with his wife, he decided to make his executive assistant the acting CEO of the company. And she did that for six months. And his leadership team came to him and said, why her? Why did you name Debbie as the acting CEO? And Gary told his leadership team is because he trusted her. She understood his goals, what his priorities were, and he felt very confident that she would be able to implement that on his behalf. And that was the case for six months and they're still together and it's a great story. It's not a very common one. It doesn't happen very often, but it's a real life, absolutely happened story. It's important to share those kinds of things you know, she's certainly not alone in having a CEO or high-level executive give massive responsibility to an assistant. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, it is a great story. Well, and one of the reasons I liked it is it just shifts the bias yes. from the old secretary mindset into a business partner conversation. And I think that was one of the things that I really picked up through the book. And and I've seen and heard about in other examples and experienced a little bit myself is people who get into this are not getting into this because they're not capable of doing other things. They're very intelligent, highly capable, intuitive people who can re be really good partners. A hundred percent. And, you know, most assistants who are, who consider themselves career assistants really get insulted when people say, so what do you really want to do? The profession is 95 to 97% female. So these women, you know, look at them and say, I'm doing it. I love my work. These assistants love what they do. That's not to say some of them have not, you know, morphed the job description or adapted it. But these are career assistants who are just incredibly important to the running of companies. Let me ask one more set the table question here, virtual assistants, because I remember, I think it was 2008, Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Workweek came out and he in there talked a lot about the power of leveraging your time yeah. and energy and was a big proponent of virtual assistants and specifically offshoring that. So that seems like that's maybe more accessible for the mid-level professional whose company won't invest in that or the lower level, mm. you know, startup entrepreneur or something like that. How do you think of the virtual assistant, maybe an offshore assistant in the scheme of, you know, the full spectrum? I think that they serve a purpose. The profession of virtual assistants has really expanded, especially since the pandemic. That said, you get what you pay for. And the offshoring, uh, the offshored virtual assistants are not functioning as a strategic business partner. They are doing transactional 
tasks. They are editing websites. They are managing databases. They are scheduling appointments, things that do not require a great deal of initiative and really understanding the unique preferences of executives. And I often hear leaders say, oh, yeah, I have an assistant who $5 an hour. There's a huge time difference. And sometimes a leader's not working with the same person. So not all leaders want that. You know, if a leader is prepared to not work with the same virtual assistant from task to task and is okay with massive time differences, so there's not really a need to connect one-on-one, then it might be a great solution. But the leaders who are wanting more one-on-one, higher level support, then a virtual assistant may not be the best solution for them. It really is about understanding what is it that they need. Cameron Harold said, if you don't have an assistant, you are an assistant. So <laughs> that is true, right? And, yeah. and so however managers get the support, I'm all for it, but it's about really evaluating what are those skills and responsibilities that you don't like to do, that you don't want to do, and that you're not good at. Those are the tasks to job out. And whether that is someone in the Philippines or someone in St. Louis, then that's a personal preference that lots of managers are experimenting with. Does, I, I like that distinction a lot. Thank you. So that leads into my next question, which is, how do I know when it's time to make an investment in an assistant? Let's say I'm not a CEO who's provided one by the company. Maybe I have to make some investment out of pocket to hire somebody. What are the indicators that this might be a smart decision for me? That you're working 16 hour days and you're still not getting it all done. You know, you're running out of time. Key things are not getting done. You're not able to show up at your kid's baseball game. And you're lying in bed at night, terrified about, you know, you wake up in a cold sweat thinking about something you didn't do. I've had to do this myself. I'm a CEO of my own company and I've been working with an assistant for 12 years. And so I take my own advice, which is to job out the responsibilities that I don't like to do, I don't want to do, and that I'm not good at. And it's worth that money. I mean, when you think about what is your time worth, Branson said, time is the new money. And I think when we look at our day, when we look at our week, we want to be able to feel that, what are we working for? And that's what I would say to leaders. You'll know you need an assistant when you just simply don't have enough time to get it all done and you're procrastinating certain really important tasks that have to get done, but you just hate doing it. Yeah. I, I don't know if this, I hope that is. Uh, no, that's good. That's good. I, you know, we talk a lot to in the nature of what I do is sales. I would call it a fairly high pressure sales environment. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to grow year over year over year. And there gets to be a point where in the beginning, that's great. You can spend a lot of time going out and trying to build a book of business. But as you bring in more clients and you're working with those clients, your time to go out and find new clients comes down. And But there's still the expectation that you're going to grow. And so we talk a lot about how to leverage yourself. And so this conversation comes into play. The one thing we talk about, though, is you can use this as an excuse to do less work or you can use this as an excuse to grow and handle more capacity. And I think there's a big difference there, how you set this up with an assistant. Yeah. And it's possible that an assistant could be very useful in closing those deals. A leader is well served if he or she can put their ego aside enough to evaluate is it necessary that you be present at every meeting or is it possible that your assistant could actually cover that meeting for you? Is it possible that 30 minute meetings could turn into 15 minute meetings or 20 minute meetings? Some assistants with the support of their leaders insist that anybody making a meeting with the leader 
sends an agenda ahead of time so that it's very clear what is going to be discussed. There's a real strategy around the use of time. How are meetings run? Do they start on time? Do they end on time? Does everybody know when the hard stop is and honor it in order for the days to not just creep into weeks and months. And then you get to November and say, holy crap, where did the year go? I didn't get this stuff done. And there's a better way. There's a better way. And, and, you know, we're all running so fast. The world has, the world is chaotic. You know, we've all been through a lot in the last three years. And my message in Staff Matters, this new book, if there's any message that's the through line of the book, it is that leadership would do very well to, you know, they're very busy trying to solve problems. How about looking straight to your staff, the people you painstakingly hired in the first place who could possibly, probably offer realistic, actionable, reasonable solutions to those problems. I see, O'Brien, such a disconnect with leaders around the world whose assistants are telling me, nobody's asking me. I see solutions, but, you know, my opinion isn't very welcome. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to not look to the people who are already on the payroll. Yeah, absolutely. Especially especially if they are intertwined in your business and in the way that you work, because they get to observe, they get to be that neutral observer. And we all know like we're better when we observe a situation than when we're in a situation. And so to be able to ask those people what they're seeing, that makes all the sense in the world. Now that you say it, I don't know that I've been doing that well, but I'm going to try going forward. I mean, you might think that it slows the process down to ask those questions. And I say, bring those people into the meeting and ask them, for their opinions and see what happens. I think it's worth a try. Those leaders I know who have done this are astonished at what their people know. Yeah. Okay. So you've convinced me. I want to hire an assistant. What am I looking for in the interview process? How do I evaluate what makes a good assistant and what doesn't? You know, I was talking to a CEO the other day who said he hires for energy. He wants the energy to be positive coming back at him. And his point of view is that the assistant doesn't have to have all the skills, but they absolutely need the right attitude and the right energy. I am a big believer in trial periods, whether it's a week, two weeks. I think that is a really smart strategy Now, a lot of people are working these days virtually and remotely, and they're working over Zoom and and Teams, et cetera. And that's a great thing to do. My assistant and I function on Zoom each week. But during the interview process, O'Brien, it is necessary to, if you're going to be working remotely and virtually, to fly the assistant to headquarters or have the, the leader fly to the assistant This is such a key hire. This is such an important hire. I absolutely believe you cannot understand what you need to know from a Zoom interview. You certainly can't know it from one interview. An assistant really is valuable if she or he can meet a lot of the people on the team. And there's no substitute. Perhaps you know this from personal experience, but I believe there's no substitute for being in a room with people, having a meal, a cup of coffee, and seeing the way people speak with one another. What's the vibe? What's the culture? It's critical to have that personal interaction. But beyond that, it's about talk to me about what is it that you love doing? And what is it that you love about being an assistant? Tell me your point of view. And then for leaders, it's imperative to share, are you looking for a business partner? Or are you looking for someone who's simply going to do transactional work? One of the other big disconnects that I hear about from all over the world is the lack of clarity when it comes to setting those kinds of expectations. Then there's all this confusion that results. You know, like 
he or she doesn't let me do anything. I don't have access to the inbox. So I believe assistants need to ask better questions. Talk to me about the culture of the company. How long have you been here? What do you love about this company? You know, how long did the last assistant stay? To be transparent and forthcoming about that kind of information, because this is a close relationship, that there's a lot riding on it. So I believe in hiring slow and firing fast. So you would kind of led into my next question, which was about what does an assistant look for when they're being interviewed? You had kind of mentioned, you know, some stuff about the company, but what are the best practices do you find or what advice do you have for somebody to make sure that they're getting into a good, healthy situation and not inadvertently getting hired by a tyrant? Toxic work environments led by leaders who I believe it's not that they're intending to be tyrants necessarily. I think they just don't know. And so I advise assistants to sit there and say, ask questions like, how do I win with you, O'Brien? And how do I lose with you? Mm, That's a great question. So, you know, what is it that makes you tick essentially? I get asked that question. Don't make me late. Don't lie to me. That elicits a lot of questions. The other question to ask is, so O'Brien, how are you on your worst day? You know, and that'll let me know, are you a yeller? What do you need to do when you, because stress is a given. It's not if, it's when it's going to happen. Yeah, those kinds of personality questions can elicit powerful answers. What do you, what do you think? I think those are great. And I think if somebody glosses over those, if the one who's interviewing you or the person you're going to work with glosses yeah. over those, that's probably a red flag because I'm in sales and and I get buyers all the time who will kind of tell me what I want to hear. But when I ask deeper probing questions, they won't really be willing to go there. And we never win those deals. They just, they always either have another relationship or they were never going to move in the first place. And I see that dynamic sort of the pattern. Yeah. And I could see that happening there where this person, you know, is like, I'm not going to tell you I'm a monster. No, no, it's fine. You know, I, I can get a little mad when this happens or, you know, whatever. And they can kind of gloss it over. If you feel that glossing happening, that's probably a red flag. I mean, it's a great question you're asking because what I advise assistants to do, I think assistants could do much better in the interview process to ask questions like, so, you know, O'Brien, I know that, you know, assistants see and hear everything and people talk to me. In general, people say things to assistants that they would never say to you as the leader. And O'Brien, do you happen to be aware of that? May I ask you? Are you aware of that? I don't know that I had ever thought about it, but it makes total sense. And ask your assistant and every room of assistants I ever ask that question of, it's a big fat yes. that people. That's a great way to get a cheap 360 done. Oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, (laughs) I knew working with Olympia Dukakis, people, you know, were very reluctant to speak honestly with a famous person, especially. And she knew that people were definitely saying things to me that they would never say to her. And it's an important thing for leaders to know. I like your point about the trial period too, Mm -hmm. because I have worked with a couple of people I worked with one person in particular who was a wonderful person, was very eager, willing to jump in and help. But every time they jumped in to help, I wound up with a thousand questions back. They were looking to me to really tell them how to do the thing that I had asked them to do. And so they weren't able to be agile or think on their feet or use their own intuition to just go out and try something. But you never would have known that because you'd have met the person and they're very eager and they knew all the programs and they had all the skills, but they didn't have that, I don't want to say cognitive ability, but they just, they weren't programmed in a way to go out and take initiative, risk things unless you told them exactly what they needed to. And that trial period would reveal that. Absolutely. You know, it's actually like an audition. It's a working, it's a working interview. If you need a writer, give them something to write. If you have an itinerary to get planned, give them that as a task, like give them actual work, stuff that you actually need done. 
I think it's a brilliant tactic, especially in the new workplace we've got going on with people working remotely and virtually. And I actually remember what I wanted to say before, and it's an important point. So may I do that? Yeah. That in an interview, when an assistant is talking with a leader, the question is, since people talk to me, people will say things to me, when I hear something firsthand that I believe you need to know, A, do you want me to tell you? And B, how do you want me to tell you? Do you want me to pick up the phone? Do you want an email? It's not if, it's when I'm going to hear something that I believe you should know. So may I know your point of view on that? And to get ahead of that is a really smart move because then it's going to happen where you get wind that somebody is going to quit, for example. Yeah. Then you know your leader has already told you how they want you to handle it. And then they're not surprised when it's like, oh, we need to talk. I need five minutes kind of thing. Yeah. Great advice. Want to highlight something we talked about right before we jumped on and hit record here. And I've kind of danced around it. But when I had sent you the list of questions that we might want to talk yeah. through, I, I had used the terms assistant and boss just because I didn't know what else to use. Mm-hmm. And you pointed out, yeah, we don't really use that term anymore. So- We've talked about executive assistants, personal assistants, administrative assistants, but what about the person who's hiring the assistant? What do we call that person these days? The person an assistant is supporting. You know, when I was working with Olympia Dukakis, we didn't refer to her as my boss, that we always felt it was a negative connotation. And frankly, it's women who are referred to as bossy. Most men are not referred to as bossy. So we just, we just resisted that. But then I dug deeper and found out the origin of the word boss, which comes from the Dutch word bas, B-A-A-S, and that translates to the word master, as in master and slave. And anyone who's watched a film that talks about the Deep South can picture slaves saying boss. And, you know, in 2023, I believe we're done. We've been done with that for a long time. And so... When I speak with rooms of assistants, they get it immediately because we know that words matter. We're, the words we use I say that matter. all the time. And so I ask them, you know, talk to me about the other words you can use. And it's leader, executive, manager, supervisor, principal, colleague. Like there's so many words. And Olympia used to say, meet Bonnie. She works with us as opposed to she works for us. Small word, but big meaning. And that's what it sometimes makes the difference between being with somebody for 25 years versus six months kind of thing. So yeah, I, so I personally don't use the word boss and urge as many people who will listen to me to not use it either. All right. Well, if you're still using the word boss, it's time to rethink it. <laughs> Have I rethink convinced it. you? Let's, oh, Brian. You've convinced me for sure. I don't know that I've ever used boss, but I will talk about in a second. I get nervous offloading tasks just because I don't want to make the person feel bad. So I'll need some therapy on that in a second. But so I'm not using boss. But let's talk, let's just kind of work, keep working through this. We've talked about interviewing. Okay, I found somebody. What are the best practices for onboarding a new assistant or coming on board as a new assistant? Regular communication. You know, you talked earlier about someone asking you a lot of questions. It is work. When you bring in somebody new, it is going to take some time to develop the rapport, to fill in the blanks, but giving an assistant access to your inbox, allowing her or him to attend meetings that are not super confidential, just so she or he understands context. And if you're hiring someone who has the skills and the experience that is commensurate with the responsibilities that you want them to hold, then they will be able to hit the ground running and have a minimum of those kinds of questions and only have to ask them one time. It is imperative to have one-on-one time. Some assistants and executives do 10 minutes a day, five days a week. Others have a regular time, but absolutely three days a week 
you know, for a minimum of 20 minutes seems appropriate if, if an executive has a very busy life and you're ruled by the calendar. Most assistants at a high level are in charge of the calendar. That executive is not really allowed to touch it. And it is all organized by the assistant. But these regular check-ins are a leader's opportunity and both of their opportunities for feedback, for regular feedback to say, listen, I want to, and I do this with my assistant all the time. Listen, I want to rethink something that happened at our last meeting. You know, I, I want to revisit that. I, I feel like I might've offended you or it's a time to get ahead of anything that may be brewing. Talk to me about how that went down, that, you know, some, if there was a mistake that happened, help me understand. I love that phrase. Help me understand how that's not going to happen again. Right. I've said that to my assistant. It's like mistakes are going to happen, but help me understand what we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again. So regular feedback is critical. It goes without saying, I hope to pay people fairly market value. And it's important to offer as you can regular professional development opportunities for an assistant. But, you know, you said something earlier about sometimes you feel badly about offloading a responsibility. Assistants love this stuff. And the key issue, the, the chapter four in my book is called ask first. If there's a birthday present, that you need purchased and you just, you know, you have a choice between having a high level meeting that's going to bring in money and going shopping or going on Amazon. An assistant needs to just be asked, assistant, I have this need. Could you do this for me? How would you feel about doing that? And most assistants, I'm hear me when I tell you that unless it's illegal or immoral and hits their moral wall, they're going to say, heck yeah, that'll be fun. Let me have your credit card. You know, some leaders have admitted to me that they feel guilty. And actually one leader told me that his wife made him feel guilty. His wife would say things like, why are you not doing that? Why are you giving that kind of task to your assistant? And my point to both of them would be, yes, a, a leader could do that birthday present buying, for example, is it really the best use of his or her time though? How much is your hourly rate worth? Now, if it's the birthday present for the spouse, that's a whole different story. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was going to say, there's a line in there where like, you should probably know your kids. You should probably know your wife. You should have good relationships. Exactly. There, so. but I yeah. think you get the point where I hope you can put aside the guilt and the guilt will go aside if you have the take the risk to have the conversation with your assistant. Like, here's your job description that we hired you in at. But now, like 12 years in to, with my assistant, I have new needs. And I say, how would you feel about doing that? How would you feel? And just talk to me. And that is a positive partnership when there can be give and take. The classic one that's in the book is in the remote world or the personal world, sometimes pets have been coming to the office, right? We've heard about that. One assistant loves dogs and brought her own dog and was very cool with taking the dogs with, for her executive for a walk at lunchtime. Another assistant wanted no part of that. And so she simply had to say, so, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that, but I will be happy to help find a dog walker for us. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. it's really about asking first. So have I helped you with your guilt? You have. You have. There's another dynamic with my situation where the woman that I work with is working with three or four other people too. We had the conversation a couple of years ago. She almost was going to come work for me directly, but we decided that it was actually okay to have her continue to support kind of the team of us. I'm still paying her a bonus out of my own paycheck, but I st I just have this guilt that like I don't want to become a burden to her in 
the context of everything that everybody has and the, the, all the work that everybody is putting on her. Like I, I really like her and I appreciate what she does. And so I want to make sure that I, I'm helping manage her workload. So that, and to your point, you just ask. And I, I tell her that all the time, like, Hey, you know, I'll keep dumping stuff on you, but you, ha- you got to tell me and push back. And she's never pushed back once. It's just a weird thing that I so have. Do you have a fear that she's burning out? I don't. I just, I guess I was brought up just in a culture of being capable and doing things yourself Mm. and not putting things off on other people, you know, not burdening somebody else if you could really do it. But is that really the best use of your time? No, no, it's not. And I know it's, I know it's something you shared with me. You're running a multi million dollar company. And, and so, you know, assistants tell me all the time leaders want to do their own correspondence, their own travel plans, and they're being paid a whole lot of money. Is that really what you're supposed to be doing? You know, how about we allow assistants to feel like they're and leverage them and utilize them to the things that they're really good at. And that frees you to do the things you're really good at. Well, and I guess in this case too, because like she handles all my travel, she handles my family's travel, she handles expenses and will be in my inbox and schedule meetings and do so she, she's doing a lot she's she's active in my business there are some more strategic things i think that i could be asking her to do that would be bigger lifts and i have maybe been hesitant to collaborate on those and and have her do some of that stuff cuz i'm afraid that it's not going to pay off because I'm I'm in sales and not everything I do pays off. And so I guess I'm worried about wasting her time. And those are the levels of things that I get a little anxious about. You're paying her hourly or salary? She is earning a salary and then I'm paying her bonus. Yeah. And I fully support you to keep bonusing her. And I would, I hope you're having regular one-on-ones. What is regular? How often do you suggest one-on-ones? Oh, well, how long have you been working together? Two years. Oh, just two years. So not a very long time. And you work together remotely, right? No, no, no. We work in the office together. Oh, you are in the office together. Fantastic. So you get one-on-one time. I mean, it really is very particular to you. When I was with Olympia for all those years, sometimes things would build up and I would need to say things to her like, Olympia, I need 30 minutes with you either today or tomorrow. And if you give me those 30 minutes, I can leave you alone for a week. So I could have that kind of conversation with her. It really depends how busy you are and like where all the moving parts are. But what I'm hearing is I'm not sure you have a clear, really clear idea of her commitments, the demands on her time from the other people. So you don't really know if she's putting in 35, 45, 55, 65 hours a week. And she might think those higher level tasks would be super cool to work on. It could be, I mean, the money is nice. The bonusing is nice, but it's also really very telling to be asked if you're interested in this other responsibility and see how that lands and see, could, you know, there's another saying I love is, could we give it a try? Do you want to give this a try and see how it feels, see how you're managing it? You can use me as an excuse and say, you know, I, I just feel compelled to ask you, are you overloaded? Are you burning out? Are you, how do you feel about this job? Because yeah. is she feeling fairly compensated and to bonus her is just an extra expression of that you really value her. I'll ask assistants, how easy would it be for your leader to live without you? And I mean, you don't want her. To no, leave, absolutely right? not. She's fantastic. So I hope you have opportunities to tell her that. You, I do tell her and that. All of that is very motivating and, you know, it inspires loyalty and it inspires going above and beyond. O'Brien bonuses me. He really shows me that he thinks I'm terrific and I'm going to bust my butt for him. Yeah. All right. Well, you've convinced me and I will have some great conversations with her. Give that a yeah. shot. She's about to have her first child and she's going to come back. But uh, yeah, no, she's fantastic. 
And it's those kinds of actions that will inspire her to come back. Yeah. So you've convinced me, and I know that maybe there are a lot of people out there that feel like I do, but there are also other people out there who hesitate to give up control because because they like the control or they're uncomfortable. There's a trust element to this too, and people want to hold things really tight to the vest. What do you say to those people who aren't as comfortable giving up control? Well, I'll point to something that Olympia would say we were together for 25 years. She knew I was going to make mistakes and screw up sometimes. In her life, my work enabled her to have peace of mind and to do the things that she wanted to do. And the price she had to pay was that from time to time, I was going to make a mistake or do something that wasn't necessarily the way she would like to do it. But she was willing to pay that price because she knew that my mistakes were never intentional. She also knew that my own rule was I I had the one-time rule. Hopefully, mistakes were not going to cost a lot of money or cause great inconvenience. I messed up some scheduling at times. I gave her the wrong speech once. I mean, there were some serious mistakes, but they only got to happen one time. She saw it as a busy leader. She saw it as the price she needed to pay for the freedom that I gave her to do her life. And so I share that with the leaders of the world who are reluctant to give up control. It is a process. It's about, you're probably not going to want to turn over your inbox on day one, but how about at month one? And that's why it's about these tests, these tasks and responsibilities. How do they handle it? And then gradually you can give up that control when you learn that you can trust someone, but you definitely want to pay fairly and have the regular communication and certainly give feedback. If something was done, not to the way you really would have preferred it to go, a leader has every right to hire someone to implement in the way they want something implemented. Yeah. And so that leads to another question I have, which is what are the best practices for giving feedback back and forth? I think this is a good question. Again, you know, this is a partnership. So what are the best practices when an assistant is not living up to the standard? And what are best practices for the assistant when their leader or executive is making things difficult? The answer is the same for both, and it is about specificity, clarity, and details. In those one-on-ones that you're having each week, it's an opportunity each week to say, you know, O'Brien, I really want to revisit something that happened yesterday with that email, and here's the email, and here's the situation. It's about specific details about what went down and what pain or itch did it cause. And to say, help me understand why I felt like you didn't trust that I was going to do that properly. Is that true? Help me understand that. And then it works both ways. An assistant needs to be really specific with a leader I have to tell you that I was really offended by blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, I need to give you a piece of feedback about X, Y, Z. The reason to offer feedback, this is an ongoing relationship. And so it's reasonable to think that if you had a problematic email yesterday, there's going to be another one next week or in two weeks. So the only reason to revisit something that happened in the past is so that the future is better. And you keep learning along the way. It's worth saying the profession of assistance is dominated by females. And I mean, I, I am female and I work with a female. And what leaders need to know about working with females in general is that we need to be overt. And I say to my own assistant, Jen, I will change my mind on things and I will need to give you feedback about changes that I want to make. It is not personal. It is not. 
this is business. This is my business. And I may be making a mistake. I want to know what you think, but in the end, it's my decision. So it is very important to me that you do not take offense when I change my mind. It is very important that you don't take things personally. I certainly want to know if you think I've offended you or I've hurt your feelings in some way, but these decisions I'm making about the business are about business. It really is about going above and beyond to get the taking offense out of the equation. Maybe you've experienced this in your own. Well, I, I mean, work, I think, but I kind of, yeah. And the, I think the principles of human interaction and giving and taking feedback. I mean, I think whether you're an assistant or a leader or a coworker or a spouse, I mean, I, I do think there's principles that apply in all of these situations, which is one of the fun parts of doing this podcast is, I get to talk about all these different types of human interactions, and then you see where the commonalities are across all of them. Feedback is received much better if there is connection before correction. If you are rock solid with your assistant and you know that her intentions are positive and she has your back and she only wants to make O'Brien as productive as possible, then when there's a piece of feedback that comes, you have that connection built. And so then you can make corrections and say, hey, I want to work that next meeting a little differently. Let me yeah. tell you what I'm, what I'm envisioning. That's a great piece of advice to think about. And, if, and it's a good piece of advice that I've probably been on the wrong side of where if you don't have a good connection with somebody, it would be worth holding the feedback, building that connection, and then delivering the feedback. I mean, you might you might be able to deliver it in the moment, but if you have the opportunity to build that relationship, err on the side of building the relationship. If there's something that's really bugging you and when I'm losing sleep or it, you know, if something is preoccupying a leader or an assistant, it's completely valid to have in your one-on-one -on -one with nobody else is around to say, you know, I've been giving something a lot of thought that I have something on my mind and I'd really like to share it with you. And then be specific and just calm, calm and clear. And that is the best kind of feedback. And, you know, tell me what you think about that. Am I off base here? Am I, you know, am I imagining that or just help me here? Just so we can move on. Because if it's preoccupying anybody, you know that that's wasting time and energy and worrying about something that turned out to be nothing is just such a colossal waste of time. I've done that plenty of times and I really don't want to do that anymore. We all have. I want to make sure that we hit on development. A lot of the conversations on this have gotten into employee development, personal development, you talk a lot of, in your book and in our conversations around developing assistance and just how neglected they are when it comes to professional development. Can you just talk to some best practices or advice you have on what does development look like in this profession? And again, it's about asking first because it's not one size fits all. Many companies are putting in annual training budget. It's a given that assistants are getting a pot of money from which to say, so O'Brien, I'd like to take Bonnie Lou Craman's workshop, be the ultimate assistant. It's a three-day event and here's the description and this is the cost involved. Historically, the role of the assistant has not been viewed as income producing. Their work does not contribute to the bottom line of a company and therefore they should not be given or invested in professional development, that is not accurate. If your assistant saves you even a week, one hour of time per week, that is equivalent to a good deal of money if you multiply that over 52 weeks. Well, that's the whole reason I have an there assistant you go. is to be better at the bottom line. That makes sense to me because that is the whole reason that I'm allowed that leverage. You know, when I attended a conference in New York City, sometimes I find an opportunity to bring Jen with me. I want her exposed 
to different learning opportunities. Sometimes there's a webinar I'll pay for. It's about asking your assistant, let's talk about what workshops, what webinars, what training are you interested in taking? Some companies pay for their assistant's MBA programs because it will serve the work. It really is about evaluating what's the need of the job and what is the interest of your assistant. Some assistants are having a ball getting their certifications in Microsoft Office technology, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and they are whizzes at that after they get their certification, which costs several hundred dollars. And then they come back and they, you know what they do? They turn around and they lead lunch and learns and teach the whole darn company. Yeah. I oh, love that. That has happened. That was another story in your book that I loved. I was like, man, what a great idea. And I will admit that I have not asked the question of my EA what, would you like what to she learn? would like to be developed. Yeah, I can tell you I'm going to though. So last question on this, maybe the last question, but one other thing I wanted to make sure we touched on is this idea of backup. So you had touched on it in your book and you explained how it was a mistake that you made that you didn't have the right practices in place to be able to take vacations and, and have the right time off. As I already mentioned, my assistant is about to have a child and she's going to be stepping away from the business for a while. So what advice do you have to assistants in general, to professionals in general, maybe just to me and us in our situation, to make sure that the system works when the assistant steps away? Because they need to. They need time to themselves and vacations and all of that. Totally do. And you know, a lot of assistants say, oh yeah, my leader goes on vacation and he or she works all the time. Well, that's their decision. And probably they're getting paid a whole lot more money than assistants do. This whole subject of backup goes much farther than money. Historically, I'll ask a room full of assistants, are you able to go on vacation? Some assistants don't even go on vacation because their their offices would fall apart without them. They literally would. In offices where there are multiple administrative professionals, my advice to them is the admins themselves need to devise the backup plan, that they need to decide who's going to cover who when they're on vacation so that when you go on vacation, which you absolutely should do, that you're able to unplug and not bring your laptop with you. So many assistants either don't take vacation or when they go on vacation, they are doing work yeah. Sometimes 80% of the time and very. So many professionals do that yes. just in general. I mean, we in America are workaholics. We do that. And this year we have people going back from vacation and then finding that they are laid off. Like there's a fear factor for going, but that aside, what I tell assistants is that leaders mainly just want to know that the work is going to get done. HR doesn't have the time to build a backup plan. Since the profession is mostly women, they don't feel empowered necessarily to ask the question, so how are we going to do this when I take my vacation with my family? But I was one of those people who I didn't have backup. I was a one-person office and I suffered mightily because of it. And there were whole years when I didn't take a vacation and I'm kicking myself I missed some really great time with my kid and I, I feel still feel badly about that. And I don't want that to happen to anybody. I don't want that to happen to leaders or assistants. Assistants need to build in the backup plan themselves. 24 hours in a day, there's a way to do it, but it requires preparation and it requires an intentionality that I'm worth this, that it shouldn't be an expectation that assistants are expected to do work the whole time they're on vacation, checking emails and, and taking phone calls, et cetera. Amen. <laughs> what do you say? What advice do you have for the single assistant? Because I get it when there's a team, but it is harder when you're a single. So what advice do you have in that scenario? So I would have wished I'd had the gumption to sit Olympia and Louie down a month before I went on vacation to say, I'm going. How are we going to have these phones answered? How are we going to have the mail handled? The truth is that no one was doing it. So when I came, I paid a huge price prepping for leaving. And then when I came back, I had a mountain of mail and phone calls that needed. It was just such an avalanche of work. 
It's about having that conversation with your leaders to say, do we bring in an intern? Do we hire a temp to not be completely me, but what tasks can the temp handle that you could be okay with? And we bring her or him in ahead of time. So we meet them, but I didn't feel frankly, confident enough to do that. And I wish I had. Well, thank you for being vulnerable with that story and those lessons learned, because I think that's how other people learn and do better for themselves. We all need to do better. Every room I'm ever in, I say, can we do better with this vacation thing and the backup issue? And they all say, 100%. Even in the busiest offices, and I think I, I tell the story about Oprah Winfrey's office, They would sit down at the beginning of the year and map it out on a big calendar. It's not if, it's when are you going on vacation? When are you going on vacation? When are you going on vacation? Not you're getting a car, you're getting a car. And then they'd map it out so that it's not that it couldn't change through the year, but then they would get to see who's going to cover who. If Oprah can do it, you can do it. Bonnie, this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. I uh, I was excited. You delivered. I, I This is just a fascinating topic, and I encourage people who are interested in leveraging themselves and, and being more productive to give this all some thought and really yeah. spend the time. If they are working with somebody, to spend the time to build that relationship the right way, and if they're not, to do the work to think about bringing somebody in to leverage themselves. Yeah, this is our lives we're talking about. And I think in this post-pandemic world, O'Brien, it's a new day where the complications are even more massive than pre-pandemic. And so we need a better way. We need a different approach. Assistants, the assistants of the world, they possess a lot of skills and talent. And my message to the leaders who are listening to this right now is to ask them, ask these people, what is it that they also know how to do that they would be interested in doing at the company? I believe that the staff are a company's golden resource that is in large part untapped. So I write about all of this in Staff Matters I do hope if you are intrigued by any of these ideas that you will check out the book because we've got a lot of work to do to adjust to this new thing we've got getting created out there. And it was funny. I had mentioned to the person who runs our EA team at Lockton where I work that I was going to be interviewing you and asked if he had any questions for you. And he said, oh, funny, I'm actually reading a book on that right now, and it's Staff Matters. And I said, that's who I'm interviewing. And it it was a really funny moment that it just happened that he was reading it right at the same time. That is wild. Thank you for sharing that. And I mean, I had no idea you were going to say that. I hope he gave you some interesting, good feedback on the book. He did. No, no, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it for sure. And then you also, are you still running the Be the Ultimate Assistant workshop? I certainly am. We're going to be in 2023. We're still going to be in Denver in July and Houston in November. We max out at 30 people. Okay. Like, I like it small. Yeah, good. So that we can group. dive deeply into these subjects that are so important. And everything we talked about on this call today, we discuss at Be the Ultimate Assistant it's a three day experience and day two is seven hours of technology with Vicki Evans, who's the best in the business. There's no way to be an ultimate assistant in 2023 unless you have stellar soft skills and superior proficiency in technology. Fantastic. That's what we do. Bonnie, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for listening. I hope this has been as helpful and insightful for you as it has been for me. would encourage everybody to check out Bonnie, all of her writing, all of her workshops. And she's the master of this. And this is what she does is help people do this type of work better. So Bonnie, thank you. Thank you, O'Brien. Thanks, everybody. (music) 
Hey folks, one last thing before you go. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with future guests. That's it. Thanks for coming. Go make the most of your business and the people in it.